that he says it ought to transform us when we're, our faith is alive and trusting in him. And so uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try to do two things especially. One thing we're going to try to do is make sure that we lay hold of the magnificent glory of what Jesus has done. That he loves us so much that he, what he said he would do, he did. He didn't just say one thing and do something else. And, and, and it's not like he didn't speak to us to guide us. But his words and his actions always aligned to the point of suffering and death for us on the cross, which is incredible and what great love this is. And the second thing I hope to do is to equip you to discern what the real thing is versus the bogus thing, the counterfeit, okay? So that's what I'm going to be doing this weekend. Uh, because a lot of people like to make a distinction between what they believe and what they do, and they kind of pick one, right? I just really want to focus on being really clear about what I believe. Or people go, ah, it doesn't really matter what you believe. It just matters what you do, right? It's a false choice. It's a false choice. You have to do both. So we're called to both. They go together hand in glove. Um, I'm going to sometimes ask y'all to talk to me, all right? So this is not entirely all monologue. Um, I think it's more fun sometimes when you guys get to talk, so just stay tuned, be on your toes. Um, have you ever heard somebody just go on and on and on talking about how good they are at something? Like some, yes, yes. You familiar with this? Yes, some head nods in the room. You've seen it. All right. It's, it's always kind of annoying when you see somebody do that. Like it gets under your skin a little bit. But it's even worse when you find out that it's all smoke. Like they're not even good at the thing that they were telling you they were so good at. Like it just, it's so much worse. Um, you know, you, you, you hang out with that person who talks about, how good they are at this video game, right? Yeah, I always get number one in the battle royale, you know? Um, you know, they, they talk about how good they are at sports, how many goals they score every time. They talk about uh, their grades all the time. Oh, I'm so smart. I get to do all this stuff. I'm, the, I'm a gifted student, right? Um, you hear about people who brag about, you know, oh, I can make that. I can do that. Their artistic skill, how good they can dance. And as it goes, the stories tend to be a little less than truthful the longer you listen to some of these folks. Or they end up just being completely bogus. You catch people just red-handed. They just made something up. Just crazy, right? So when I was in middle school, I played rec league soccer. Who played rec league soccer? Yes, put them up high so I can see you. So I want to I make eye contact with y'all so you guys relate, okay? All right, rec league soccer. I played rec league soccer in middle school, okay? So my first year, I was like, I am going to be a soccer player for the rest of my life. And then the second year of playing in eighth grade, I made an all-star team. And that was like the worst thing that could happen to me in a rec league because now I was really thinking I was hot stuff in rec league, okay? So I moved in between my eighth and ninth grade years of school. My dad was career Air Force. And so we moved in between eighth and ninth grade. And I moved to this new place and I knew that soccer tryouts were coming. And when I got on that all-star team, I had this really cool jersey I got to wear. And man, I wore that thing out. I wanted to wear it all the time. So anytime, anytime somebody gets to see that, you know, if they saw it said all-star team, they might ask and I might get to tell them about it, right? So I was hanging out with this guy talking about how excited I was to go try out for the soccer team at the high school. And I was hyped. I was like so excited. I was talking about, oh, yeah, I played on this all-star team, man. I scored these goals. Blah, 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 blah. Like I was telling all this story, right? And then, you know, the day came where it was time to try out. And so I made the team, but I did not make varsity. I made JV, and I rode the bench an awful lot that, that whole time I was honestly playing. All right? So what happened was, is that guy who I was talking to, talking all this game about how good I was at this thing, you know, he, uh, he said to me later, you know, when you were talking about it all that much, you know, I thought you would be a lot better. <laughs> but when, but when he saw me, he was like, wow, he, he told me this. He was like, wow, he, he kind of, he kind of, can I say sucks? He, he sucks. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. You know, it was such a humbling thing. It was such a humbling thing, right? Because I had talked all this game. I talked a good game. And with this jersey on, it was like I was telling people. It was like I was speaking even though I was wearing it. You know, obviously, it's a shirt. It's not using my mouth. But I'm still communicating. I've got all-star on my shirt, right? So I'm kind of communicating something about myself, you know? Sometimes we do it with our words. Sometimes we do it with our clothes. And it wasn't until there were witnesses. It wasn't until there were witnesses of the truth that it was made plain. I wasn't that good. I wasn't that good. No matter how I talked, no matter what I wore, the truth was, I wasn't that good at playing soccer. So I fell into a trap, and maybe you can relate. Maybe you can relate to this trap. 
it can feel really good to make other people think that you are better than you are at anything, right? To create the illusion that you're good at something, you know, maybe to overplay something that you're a little bit good at, but you turn the volume up like way higher than it actually is, right? We get arrogant. It can feel really good for people to think that we're better than we are, even if it isn't true. So if we do this long enough, unchecked, what happens is we start to uh, fool ourselves. We start to fool ourselves. We manage to believe the bogus story that we've repeated to ourselves over and over and over again. There's an expression that says that, you know, don't get high on your own supply. It's kind of that. Like you, you're telling the story and you're getting excited about your own story and it's not even true. We fall into a trap of settling. Settling, good bless you. We fall into a trap of settling to appear as something or someone that we're not. We might think that God is satisfied by just saying we believe in him, you know? I, I, said, the, I said the words, right? I prayed the sinner's prayer, right? So I'm good. I got my fire insurance, right? I know, at least I know I'm not going to hell because I said the prayer, right? Never mind the way you live the other six days a week when you're not in church. Yeah, y'all know. Y'all know. You go through the motions. You think, oh, well, I was baptized as a baby, so like, I'm good, right? I'm good. I can coast. You think, or maybe I was converted. Maybe y'all were converted recently and you were baptized. You're like, I'm baptized. I'm good. I've done the stuff that I'm supposed to do. I've done the things that communicate that I'm one of God's people. The outward signs are there. But here's the thing. Without living faith, that's not what God wants first and foremost from you. He wants you to have a faith that is alive daily, looking to him for everything you need, constantly <clears throat> repenting of your sin and finding assurance that he indeed has the power to save you to the very end. And then that, is what transforms us and produces the good works that he wants from us. God sees the difference between living faith that saves and dead faith, which doesn't. The same way that we can see a tree, an apple tree that produces apples versus the one that's dead and all crusty on the side of the yard and ain't producing anything but termite food, right? God can tell the difference. So I'm asking you tonight, what should the connection be between what we say and what we do as people living in God's kingdom? Whether you believe in him or not, this is still a fundamental question that we're, we're going to be dealing with this weekend. So I want to tell you a little bit about the book of James this week. I promise I didn't just pick it because it's, it's my name also that I share. Uh, this is, I, I picked this because in our theological tradition, we tend to love knowing a lot of stuff. We love knowing our stuff. And we, can, we sound really smart. We can articulate it. Oh, yes, I've memorized all 150 questions of the, children, you know, the smaller catechism, right? Some of y'all church kids know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. So some of y'all know what that's like. You know what it's like to be satisfied with being able to talk the talk. But you don't even care about walking the walk because your parents aren't living that necessarily. Maybe the leadership at your church isn't living that. The people who are helping out at like various places. Like you're not seeing the words and the actions aligned. And so you think, well, I just need to be able to say the right things. And so the book of James is a really healthy uh, corrective for us when we think about this relationship between what we say and what we do. So the book of James, the epistle, was written by Jesus' half-brother in the flesh, right? So Jesus' half-brother, James, wrote this. And so he wrote it to people who knew the faith, who grew up faithful, good Jewish boys and girls, and, it, and now are responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Jesus' brother James was a big-time leader in the early church and um, in Jerusalem in his day. So he's mainly talking to people in the book of James. He's talking to people who know some of the theology. They know all the stories. If that's not you, you got to understand who he's talking to and a little bit of who this is aimed at, right? If, that's, if you don't know a lot of the Bible stories, don't worry. I'm still going to put the cookies on the shelf where you can reach. But especially you church kids, you need to understand that like the audience of the book of James is, is very much like us who have an experience where we grew up in the church. They knew how to do church, 
but they didn't know what it meant to follow Jesus as Lord. And so this hit really close to home for James in the first century because he grew up with Jesus, but he didn't actually believe in Jesus as his Lord and Savior until later in life. Can you imagine? So it's kind of like how some people grow up in the church and they can grow up really good at being good. But they're still far from God. Because God can tell the difference about what's on the surface and what's in the heart. Okay? So what I want to encourage you to do now is I want to encourage you to listen really carefully now is I'm going to read James chapter 2, verses 14 through 19, and then I'm going to ask God to help me to say good and true things that give glory to Jesus over the course of this week, especially this week. Okay? So turn there with me with your in your Bible, and then uh, this might be this might be the most important thing you hear tonight. So if you check out after hearing the text, you might be fine. But I'm going to try to give you something to chew on, okay? So listen carefully. This is God's word from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled without giving him the things that he needs for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this was God's word. Thanks be to him. Let's pray that he would make it come alive in our hearts. All right? Let's pray. Lord, you know where everyone is in this room in their relationship with you. You know who is the one who's struggling with trying to just be a good kid, and they don't really know what it means to follow you the way that you've called them to. And they are making earnest efforts, but they are frustrated with not feeling like they're doing the right thing. They're not confident they're really following you. And Lord, I'm sure there are some in here who don't know you at all and wouldn't pretend otherwise. And so I pray that tonight that they would be intrigued at this picture of what it looks like to really be transformed by you, our God, Lord Jesus. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, you take our hearts and you change them from hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. You make us people who bear fruit, not because we're trying so hard to bear fruit, because that's just our nature now. It's what you've created in us. So God, would you help me to get out of the way of the text tonight? I ask that if I say things that are unhelpful or distracting, that they'd be forgotten really quickly. But Lord, if I say things that give you glory and clearly point to Jesus, I beg you that you would make those things stick, that you would draw straight lines, even with a crooked stick like me tonight. So Lord, use this time that you would make much of Jesus' name. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so. Let's get into it, all right? Uh, Some of you have probably heard of the five solas of the Protestant Reformation, all right? You know, Halloween, some of the people who are like, I don't celebrate Halloween, I celebrate Reformation Day, right? You know, like you're hardcore on the solas already, and you know about that, and other people barely know it, and that's okay. So the Protestant Reformation was when folks within the Catholic Church sought to reform, to correct abuses and mistakes within the Roman Catholic Church, and they became the Protestants, right? And they identified five key ways to emphasize what the Bible teaches for how people ought to relate to God through Jesus Christ. Sola is Latin for alone, okay? So the, the five emphases of how, of how God's saving works are, it is in Christ alone, by grace alone, by scripture alone, for the glory of God alone, and by faith alone. Hmm, that's interesting if you were listening to the text. What's going on there? Was the brother of James teaching something different from what the Protestant reformers were teaching? Did the Reformation disagree with what James wrote so long before? No. The issue the reformers were fighting against was the opposite issue of what James was addressing in his letter. You can think of it as like a photo negative. It's the same image, but it's, it's, it's telling you something else, right? You can hear in, in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul saying, you're saved by faith alone, right? And now you have James saying, 
you're not saved by faith alone. You're saved by faith and works. And we're going to go, wait, 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 how's that work, right? What's going on here? The issue in the Protestant Reformation was is you had a church that was telling people that they had to do good works. You, uh, you know what you believe? I mean, it's fine and good, but really what you need to do is you need to go to the confession. You need to give your money. You need to do all this stuff. You got to do all these things, and then God will save you. That will prove that that will be the way that you are sure that God loves you. And the reformers are saying, no, that's not how this works. Faith comes first. So that's what the reformers were doing. They wanted to correct the idea that you could earn your way into the kingdom of heaven. You can't. You can't. James, the brother of Jesus, so many years before, was clarifying the idea that living faith isn't just about what you say you believe, but rather it is showing that living faith works. Living faith works. When people have a living faith, their words match their actions. A person who has truly met Jesus is not the same as they were before. They are transformed. The scripture says that the old is gone, the new has come. The old man is dead, the new is alive. That's what it means if you've had a saving relationship with Jesus and you have one that is ongoing. So you know who's actually a good soccer player? It's not the person who puts on the messy jersey, right, and just wears it to the game, not necessarily. It's when the dude puts on the jersey and like he's got the stats to back it up, right? It's the person whose actions match what they say. So one pastor, teacher I had, put it like this. I'm going to use the dry erase board because I, I'm going to refer to this a few times through the weekend. If you have to use this board and erase it, I won't be offended. You just have to put up with me writing it again and again and again. So what's going to happen here is I want to show you how this equation gets messed up. And I'm going to keep pointing you back to the proper equation for how to think about faith and works. So some people think works, you know, I'm going to abbreviate it with just a W. Works is going to be W, and salvation is going to be S, okay? Works leads to salvation. That is one formulation. Some people think faith, F is going to be short for faith, plus works leads to salvation. And some people say faith leads to salvation. But the formula that I'm going to try to convince you is what the Bible teaches is that is faith leads to salvation and that salvation produces works. I know we're getting into the finer points, but if you mess this up, you mess up the gospel. I'm dead serious. If we, it's not, it's not this. It's not this. It's not this. It's this. Faith leads to salvation, and that salvation produces works. That's how this works, okay? I'm going to make reference to that more than one time this weekend, all right? So watching hours of your favorite live stream of some professional gamer on Twitch is not going to make you a professional gamer. It helps you play better, but it's not going to make you a pro. Watching ballet performances for hours and hours and hours doesn't make you a prima ballerina. Knowing your favorite singer's songs doesn't make you a rock star. Watching every pro game and knowing everybody on the team and knowing the coach and all their stats doesn't make you a pro baller. And here's the kicker, especially for church kids, churchy people who are good at being good. Studying the Bible, speaking the right lingo, wearing the right clothes, fighting for the right cause, serving your neighbor, coming to a retreat doesn't save you from the wrath of God due to each and every one of us because of our sin. It's not it. Make no mistake, apart from being saved from the wrath of God due to us for our sin through faith in Jesus Christ, all the seemingly good works in the world won't help us. We must be born again out of true faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and he in him he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, somebody say it loud, you can do, that's what's up. Yes, you could do nothing. So living faith results in salvation, which produces good works. 
Living faith is always turning from sin and looking to Jesus to finish the good work he's begun in us. The book of James is saying a faith that claims, I believe in God, but doesn't produce love for God, doesn't produce love for neighbor, is like the faith of demons. Whoa, that's strong medicine right there. They believe God exists. So what? They believe God exists and they shudder. The best we can say is, if the best we can say is I believe in God, but our faith is dead, our faith is not producing works, we should shudder too. And that's because we might still be God's enemies. So why should this matter to us? The one who I hope to make a big deal about this weekend is the one who can give us hope when we realize that we're in deep trouble because we haven't given a rip about good works the way he talks about it. He's the only one who gives us hope when we realize that we've got dead faith and we've been trying to produce good works apart from him. In Jesus, we see that he both spoke words of faith and belief and his actions bore the fruit of righteousness. God, through Jesus Christ, has spoken. He has acted also for our salvation and for the sake of his great name. Jesus Christ didn't just say it's important to help people and to love God, but he also demonstrated it. He laid down his life for us. He didn't just call us to be merciful. He gives mercy. He is the fountain of mercy. And he gives mercy to everyone who deserves judgment, which is you and me. And then he calls those same people who have received his mercy and blessings to go and pour it out on others. So remember, because God has spoken and he has acted to save whosoever believes, our words and deeds ought to match. So as you do good works, as, as you think about how to relate to this, I want you to know that this is an opportunity for you to examine that, it, you know, am I doing more than just saying I believe in God, right? First of all, we should recognize our failure to do as God has commanded with us. Each of us have failed to obey God's command to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this is true for believers and non-believers. So the first thing we're called to do is confess our need, to realize that we're helpless, to confess our sin and repent. And next, and this is really important, I don't even know if you can say one comes before the other because sometimes, sometimes this happens at the same time. You put your hope in the one who never failed to keep God's law. Because you and I are going to blow it all the time. Even after we start to, even as we start to put our faith in Jesus, we're still going to find that we blew it. So we put our faith in the one who never failed to keep God's law. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. He is the only man who ever lived up to the things he said, whose words and deeds always proved who he was. His perfect record is available to you on judgment day, if you believe. So make serving others, make doing good works part of your dream of what it means to be a Christian as you mature, not just knowing stuff, but actually have a faith that like puts on shoes and goes and does stuff. It puts on work gloves, right? Plenty of people accept just doing church on Sunday as their Christianity. That's it. I go to church. I'm a Christian. I want you to see that if that's all we do, that might be counterfeit. Plenty of people do that. They settle for it. And Jesus called us to follow him out of selfishness, out of, living selfishly, out of living selfishly the other six days of the week also. So that kind of faith, that kind of faith is the faith that the book of James is warning against as useless. It will neither help our neighbor, nor will it save us from God's judgment on the last day. We must respond to God, not just in word, but also in deed. And how we're going to do that, we'll talk about that more this weekend. So in my pride, I wanted people to think that I was actually better than I was at soccer, right? That was the, the story I wanted to tell y'all. I wanted people to accept me based on appearing to be one of the cool athletic kids. I still struggle with wanting people to think that of me today. I'm 41, and I still find myself repenting of wanting to impress people around me, like a 12-year-old kid still. So don't feel bad if you find yourself doing that. Just know that that's a real problem. It's, it's serious, and it sticks a long time sometimes. The truth always comes out in the testing. And I want my story to help you when you think of how faith works. Anyone can claim to be something. Anyone can claim something to be true about themselves, but is it true before God? Do others witness it to be true? Do you say you believe in God? Do you say that you follow Jesus? The choices we make show whether we have a living or a dead faith or not. It's a way for you to be a fruit inspector, which is the best any of us can be. 
Like we don't, like we have to trust God to be the one who, who really is the ultimate judge. But you and I get to be fruit inspectors. And we kind of go, is this good or bad fruit? Are we producing fruit? If I'm not, why? What's happening? Where's the breakdown? So remember James's good word. Not this James, but the James of the Bible here, all right? I want you to remember what is here, especially you who have tender hearts, who are faithful, and you feel like nothing you do is good enough, even when you are producing good works. I want you to know that one of the verses we didn't read that's right before the section I read is in James chapter 2, verse the second half of verse 13. It says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Hear that loud and clear, you tender-hearted ones. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus Christ, instead of quickly condemning us as sinners, came and saved us. All who would believe, and he had mercy on us. So let us be people who serve others sacrificially, who do good works, not out of performance, but out of Jesus working in us, transforming us, so that we become like that apple tree that produces apples, because that's what an apple tree does not trying to do it to impress anybody. It just is. It just does. We become people who care for the poor, the hungry, the sojourner, orphans, widows, with hearts filled with gratitude for what God has done, who not only speaks to us through the scriptures, but he also acted to suffer and die in our place so that we could live with him. While we were yet sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us to free us from slavery to sin and death, to get us off the treadmill of trying to just be good. What Jesus offers you is so much more fulfilling than that. It's so much better than just trying to be good. It's because of this glorious good news that I want to tell you about more this weekend that we are, uh, that, that we, are uh, we are to believe and to do good works toward God and those in need as he works this in our hearts. That's all I'm going to say tonight. We'll talk about it again two more times as we look at James 2. If you have questions, good. If you see me and you want to ask me questions, I'd love to talk to you. I'm like, I'm an extrovert. Like, I can have a conversation with this, like, this stool. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. That was the worst. Um, I got it. It's still stacked nicely. I got it. Here we go. That was, that was like, that was the worst. I'm so sorry. Anyway, faux pas. All right. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to close this in prayer. And then, I guess you're going to worship some more after that? No? Wrap up? All right. Where do they need to go after, after I'm done praying? You're going to do it next? Awesome. All right. Let's pray. Lord, it is good news that you are not just a cruel taskmaster like the Pharaoh of old saying, work harder. Do more. In Christ, salvation is accomplished. Jesus, you cried out, it is finished. And that is such good news for us. And yet, we are still down here working out what it means to truly believe in you. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to do this careful work of understanding what it means when you call us to do good works. And that we would understand you're not just calling us to jump through hoops but you're calling us to examine ourselves if we actually are truly believing in you. And if there's evidence of that being borne out in our lives. And God, you are so merciful that Lord, I I pray that you would be doing work in the lives of students right now, that they would be curious about what it really means to follow Jesus if they aren't doing it yet. And that they would, as they turn to you, as they open up the scriptures, as they think about what you've accomplished, that they would find you to be the one who is slow to anger, who is quick to love, who is abounding in steadfast mercy. And Lord, as that takes root, then it would kind of click almost without even trying of, oh, that's where good works go. That's how they show up in my life. So Lord, bless us this weekend as we focus on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.